Gasoline fuels most of our cars as we drive from point A to point B. And honestly, it would be a really dumb idea to light up a cigarette at a gas station. We all know gasoline is flammable. It's volatile. It exists in this highly energetic state. So if you add a spark or some heat to gasoline, you get an explosion. Well, Dr. Scott Widenmeyer says you can substitute cholesterol for some of the fuel our bodies burn through. Metabolic stress and inflammation? You could consider those to be the sparks. Dr. Widenmeyer is looking at the combustion those sparks produce at the molecular level. He's our guest today on Researchers Under the Scope. Hello, I am your host, Jen Cannell, and we are recording this on Thursday. It's the 27th of October. Our guest today is Dr. Scott Wittenmeyer. He's an assistant professor of anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology at the College of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. And his lab studies the biology of molecular systems, the way our immune systems and our metabolism interact. So he joins us virtually now. Hello there, Dr. Wittenmeyer. Hi, Jen. Nice, nice to be here. Way back during the pandemic, you had actually beat out a whole bunch of applicants across Canada. You became the Heart and Stroke Foundation's McDonald's Scholar with the National New Investigator Award. So first off, congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was a real honor and privilege that the reviewers of that uh, competition felt the research we're doing in our lab is, is strong enough to be ranked that high. So thank you. Looking back at the path your career took, at what point would you say you knew you wanted to be a scientist? Oh, well, I was interested in science at a different, in several different points in my life. But really, when I was in my early 20s and I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my life, uh, I started going to the University of Regina as an undergraduate student. And before that, I was working on the oil rigs. And I kind of, at that point, realized that winters are just too cold to continue doing that. And so, uh, yeah, I went to the University of Regina and, and basically I, was at, I was, wasn't sure what I was going to do with my life, but I was interested in biology and human physiology, basically how the body works. And I was in a class that studied how, how neurotransmitters control heart rate. And it was a really fascinating lab experiment we did during that, that class, which basically um, showed that there's chemicals that are secreted from neurons that control the rate of the heart, and it made me fascinated. And so I uh, shifted towards that path. More classes, more labs that look at how, how the body's working, how the experiments were done to show that these things are, are the way they are. And just following that path eventually led me to a career in science. Can you take me back a second to that experiment with the neurotransmitters and heart rate? Yeah, it was an undergraduate course. And basically the, the experiment was set up so that you had a, a strong heart that was beating and you had the nerve still connected to it. And the experiment would work that you would, you would stimulate the nerve with a probe and it would make the heart rate change. And it was in like a bath solution, but then they took that solution and moved it to another setup that was exactly the same. And just taking the solution from the one heart that was stimulated to the other solution caused the heart to also change its heart rate. And that was the maybe 80 years earlier, that was the experiment that showed that neurons secrete chemicals that affect biology. I led to a Nobel Prize and had lots of cool results that came from that. And before then, everybody thought that neurons talk to organs by just sending electrical pulses. So I was just like, wow, that's awesome. I want to keep looking at this. Yeah. So where did you go as you kept looking deeper and deeper sort of at the way our yeah, I guess the, the way our insides work. Yeah, I, I would say that life for me has been just a process of continually looking back at what is it that attracts my interest the most, what are my priorities in life. And I started to really get interested in endocrinology, how hormones control different biological processes while I was still at Regina. And by that stage, I was interested in diabetes. And so I went to the University of British Columbia, where there's a 
a group of scientists there that are, have very strong work in the diabetes area. And I worked on this gut hormone that controls how glucose is managed in the body. I'm also kind of wondering, endocrinology, like why that particular path? I think the short answer is I really like the elegance of the feedback circuits. So I don't know if you ever, probably you, maybe you've heard of the HPA axis. No. It's a hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And this axis works such that the part of the brain communicates to this little organ up here called the pituitary, and it sends a signal to the pituitary to say that um, we're under stress. That's one example. And then the pituitary releases another hormone that then feeds onto the adrenal gland. And the adrenal gland, which is by the kidney, secretes another hormone that then talks to the rest of the body and says, we're under stress, we need to deal with this problem. And then as that happens, and the stress uh, starts to go away, the adrenal secretes enough of the hormone that feeds back on the hypothalamus and says, okay, we have too much, like slow down your what you're saying. And then that whole thing sits in a homeostatic circuit. So it's always, this, there's feedback in every step that can make sure everything's working the right way it's supposed to be working. And you get and, that feedback quickly. Yeah, and so I like that. I like logic and I like how things talk to each other to make sure everything's balanced and working properly, which is what homeostasis basically means. Everything's balanced. And from what you were working on in terms of diabetes, mm -hmm. what was your next step? Well, after uh, UBC, I was fortunate enough to land a position at, the, at Harvard University with a I guess I would call him famous uh, scientist named Gokhan Haramishikal, who is one of the pioneers in a field called immunometabolism, which is basically show that the immune system, which is normally involved in fighting against bacterial pathogens or viruses, even, even COVID, and the metabolic system, which we usually think about as uh, when we take in food, the, bo the body takes in food, and then those nutrients have to be put into different parts of our body. But the field of immunometabolism asks, how do those two systems talk to each other? And over the last 30 years, I would say, there's been an overwhelming amount of evidence to show that in the context of obesity, which is really for me an area where I spend most of my time asking questions, that communication to the immune system and the metabolic systems are, are they're dysfunctional and contribute to a lot of the diseases that we see linked to obesity. Oh, okay. So what did you look at in the labs at Harvard? Yeah. So while I was there, I was, uh, I became interested in how the body manages cholesterol. And I discovered under Gokhan's supervision that uh, there's this transcription factor that sits in a part of the cell and it recognizes when cholesterol is too high. And when it recognizes that that happens, it changes where it goes in the, in the cell and it regulates a, uh, response by the cell to try to prevent the cholesterol from causing damage and stress. Ah, it sort of goes into a protective mode. Exactly. Yes. So it keeps the cells healthy despite there being too much cholesterol around. And we were able to demonstrate that by using a few different techniques, including just removing the transcription factor from the cell using certain genetic engineering techniques. And then you see the cell gets really sick when you expose it to high cholesterol. We were able to publish that work in some, some of the the best journals in our field. And so there were lots of opportunities at that stage. This is still pre-COVID when things were uh, not as crazy as it came after COVID happened. And my wife and I, we discussed, we're like, where should we go? There's all these different places that are interesting. We kind of wanted to stay in touch with family though. And my wife got to the point where she said, it's okay if it's a cold place. <laughs> Even <though> she... <laughs> and then a uh, position opened up at the U of S. It kind of opened up exactly when my, my first big paper got published. And so uh, I submitted an application to come here and um, came here and, uh, you know, enjoyed the faculty that are here and the infrastructure that's here to do research. It was surprisingly much more advanced than I was anticipating. And uh, I don't know, I just felt like it was a good fit for me. And when they made me an offer, I decided I would come to the U of S. Well, you're originally from Saskatchewan too, aren't you? I am from Saskatchewan. I'm not from Saskatoon, but I am from Saskatchewan. So uh, having that link was nice to get back in touch with my family and my wife's family's, you know, a little bit west, more all west, but closer than where we were when we were in Boston. Uh, so yeah, family is important to us. Yeah. 
Well, and you would have had your lab up and running just before the pandemic. It's been almost four years now that you've been here, right? It, yeah, it was well four and a half now. It was um, one one and a half years before the pandemic started and got shut down. Yep. So what did the shutdown actually change? Uh, it changed. So for one of my graduate students, it really delayed her, her, her work a lot. And that was too bad. But she just defended last Friday and successfully. So good for her, that's, uh, she did a great job. And now she's uh, got her master's degree. But for the most part, we all had to adapt just like the rest of the world. And so put us back a few months. But everybody was still in my lab was was happy to you know get back as soon as they could, and so we've managed as best as we can. I, I think is the only way to say that. Yeah. Well, and I was going to ask: is it? It's quite hands on. Like it's not just literature reviews you're doing. Yeah, most of the stuff we do is is learned by doing experiments at the bench or, in you know that kind of stuff. What is the question that at this point you're focused on answering? My goal is to have a program. And I like my students and hopefully will eventually get post postdocs like I was in Boston and have a research associate. So I like to have it so that there's, you know, a set of boundaries and then people can explore everything within those boundaries. And so the, the boundaries are the big question is how do the cells, how do um, our, how does our body manage the stress of too much nutrients like we see in obesity? Yeah. And we have a major focus right now on cholesterol still and we're asking questions such as this molecule i discovered when i was in boston that plays a role in protecting the cells how does that actually protect the the body from too much cholesterol like mechanism and we're also looking at a sister protein for that molecule as well are those ones the transcription factors yeah the transcription factors we call them nrf1 and nrf2 and we're trying to understand how they control the liver's response to too much cholesterol because there's a lot of work right now that shows that too much cholesterol in the liver is what causes the liver to transition from a just a fatty liver that's relatively benign and not so bad for the liver to a more progressive state called steatohepatitis, which is basically the immune system is attacking stuff inside the liver that looks like a like a disease, and it triggers the onset of fibrosis, cirrhosis liver cancer. These are the things that trigger those responses, those events. And so cholesterol actually crystallizes within the liver and can trigger those things to happen. Ah. So we want to, can these transcription factors actually prevent those crystals from forming? If, if it can't stop the crystals, can it stop the stress that the crystals cause? And then by doing so, if we ex- enhance those actions, will that prevent liver cancer? Will that prevent cirrhosis, liver dysfunction, and things like that? Well, the liver's kind of a really neat organ in that there's a certain amount of regenerative potential there, but not a lot. Yeah. Well, the regenerative potential can also make it a a tissue that can be highly predisposed to cancer too. So it's that reach How? that well that regen uh, cells can become more likely to become cancerous if their if their capacity to divide and grow is um, higher. So that continually re- replacing your genome creates more chances for mutations to happen that are cancer causing. Oh boy. There's also the main organ that deals with toxins and react to oxygen species or oxidative stress. And so it's always at risk of being um, exposed to genome damage and things like that. Yeah. So there are all these things can contribute to liver cancer. So in the lab, what are some of the things you're looking at, like the questions that are currently underway and being answered? My lab is kind of split into two halves right now. One is what other factors contribute to protecting cells against cholesterol? This is sort of a fundamental question, and we're using some of the cutting edge technology that's available right now, collaborating with some of the other investigators in Saskatchewan, such as uh, Franco Vijikumar, who's great with doing genomics work. And then we're collaborating with a person in Regina named Mohan Babu, who's really great at doing something called molecular systems biology. Um, he can basically measure all the proteins in a sample at the same time. And he can measure all the transcripts or the, the gene expression in the sample at the same time using new techniques. 
But the questions we're, we're always trying to come back to is, uh, can we find a new molecule that protects tissues from too much cholesterol? And we're looking at that in the context of still with uh, fatty liver disease, um, atherosclerosis, and we're kind of hovering around those two areas mostly. Cause, so uh, fatty liver disease and hardening of the arteries? Exactly. So the cells that people probably heard of atherosclerotic plaques. So atherosclerotic plaques are basically um, areas where cholesterol is accumulated and that cholesterol is damaging to the tissue and can also crystallize. And so we're asking, can we find molecules that help those cells stay safe from cholesterol too? The issue with cholesterol is that we absolutely need it, but we also need it to be exactly the right amount. So our body has more than 100 genes dedicated to controlling just the exact amount of cholesterol that's within our cells and circulating in our body. And in today's context, though, there's lots of times where that, that capacity gets stretched, especially under conditions of obesity. And so, you know, our body's asking, what are those natural adaptive systems? And then if we can find out what they are, can we make them work better to, you know, secure a safe response to cholesterol? The homeostasis. Exactly. That's right. Yep. If you look at the medical implications of finding answers to a few of these questions, you've mentioned arthrosclerosis, uh, fatty liver disease, and liver cancers. Do you see other applications too? I believe there will be, but I think my lab will need to focus on just these areas. And uh, we'd be happy to share and collaborate with anybody who studies these other aspects. For instance, neurodegeneration and uh, multiple sclerosis. There's issues with cholesterol handling in the brain, even Alzheimer's. So, Dr. Widenmeyer, what's coming up for you as we look towards 2023? Yeah, that's a great question. We are, we've made a lot of progress with understanding the role of NRF1 and NRF2 in the liver. And next steps in the next year or two, we'll be asking if we, um, we have these tools now to enhance their activity in the liver. Or we're going to ask using uh, model systems, can enhancing their activity, protect the liver from cancer, protect the liver from fibrosis. And then on the other side, we've, we've identified some molecules that may be important for protecting um, cells from too much cholesterol. And so we're still trying to verify if that's the case and, and try to understand how they contribute to cellular protection. If we can find out if that's happening, then we'll ask now if we make these molecules work better, can we protect whatever cell we're looking at from too much cholesterol. And then if that turns out to be the case, we'll reach out to clinical researchers and ask them, maybe you can look at the stuff we're looking at in human disease and ask if this is relevant. And, you know, is there a way we can turn this into a medicine? That would be great. Absolutely. Well, and you're also, you have a teaching role coming up too, don't you? That's right. Yes, I am also uh, teaching and I'm starting a new class in January called Immunometabolism and Health and Disease, which uh, I think isn't being taught anywhere in Saskatchewan and maybe not anywhere in Canada. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll start catching students up to what's going on in this, in this new field that's been developing over the last 30 years. Is this a graduate studies class or is it for undergrads? It's both. We're going to have a 400 level students and for graduate level students can take the class at the same time because most grad students also never received education for immunometabolism, but we'll definitely link things to obesity, but we'll also talk about autoimmune diseases and actually cancer has been turned out to be a really surprising result where just the, the metabolic pathways used by um, these immune cells called T cells. So I've just been learning about this more recently that if, if T cells use glucose as an energy source or fat as an energy source, that'll actually greatly impact its ability to target cancer cells. And so there's new terms in the field now, like T cell exhaustion and stuff like that, which basically means if the T cell isn't able to metabolize properly, then it won't be able to recognize the cancer cell. Ooh, which would let the cancer cells just spread unchecked. Exactly. So there's a lot of growth now in the T cell area as to target cancer. And so... They're trying to understand well, how do we influence metabolic flux in those cells so that they can be better at targeting cancer. Well, good luck with it. Thank you so much for telling us all about it today, Dr. Widenmeyer. Yeah, thank you. It was great to be here and uh, I enjoyed talking with you too.
Dr. Scott Wittmeyer is an assistant professor of anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. He's a molecular systems biologist, and you can see his lab and more of his work at medicine.usask.ca. Researchers Under the Scope is a presentation of the Office of the Vice Dean of Research at the U of S College of Medicine. We record and produce this podcast on Treaty 6 territory, and we pay our respects to both the Métis and First Nations ancestors of this place. We reaffirm our relationship with one another, and we'd sure like to thank you for tuning in. I'm Jen Cannell, your host, and we release a new episode of Researchers Under the Scope every two weeks, so find those little dots up in the corner and hit follow so you can stay up to date. 